Now 7 o'clock, I'd like to call this town hall meeting to order and thank you all for coming. Welcome to Heartland. I want to thank publicly the Village of Heartland for its cooperation in setting up this meeting and for local law enforcement officials in Waukesha County for their service at the meeting. I appreciate the opportunity to hear your concerns. In fact, this is the 76th public meeting face-to-face -face that I've held since January. You probably know that some of these meetings have become contentious. So I want to be sure to review the rules that we need to adhere to so that we can have an orderly environment in which to exchange ideas. First, I ask all of you to sign in with my staff. If you would like an opportunity to speak, you need to check the speaking box that appears on the sign-in slips. That way I'll know to call on you during the first portion of the meeting. I will be giving priority to those of you who reside in Heartland and adjoining communities. And then if time permits, I will continue to call on residents of the 5th Congressional District who live elsewhere. If additional time is available, I will call on those who do not reside in the 5th Congressional District. This portion of the meeting will last about an hour and 20 minutes. I expect participants to be respectful and to allow the person who is recognized and has the floor the opportunity to speak without interruptions as well as when I answer questions. Further, if the question you would like to ask or the comment that you would like to make has already been made, please refrain from asking it again. We should try to hear from as many of you as we can and on many, as many issues as possible as we can within the time constraints. If at any time participants become rude or disruptive, I will immediately adjourn the meeting as there is nothing positive to be gained from continuing with a meeting that is disorderly. We can all disagree without being disagreeable. The second portion of this meeting is devoted to those of you who seek my help with personal problems they are experiencing with the federal government. The way I know you would like to speak with me privately about these matters is if you indicate that on the very bottom of the sign-in slip. This part of the meeting is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one private conversation and it is not the time to continue discussions from the general part of the meeting. Any filming or recording of this is prohibited during this portion of the meeting because some of the people wish to talk to me about very private issues such as problems that they have with VA medical. And uh, there ought to be you know, a great deal of uh, uh, acceptance of the fact that this should not be taped and spread around the internet and the like. So having that said, you know, I will repeat that uh, uh, there will be no disruptions or the meeting won't continue anymore. And first up is Robin and Karen Lyons of East Capitol Drive in Hartlett, Mr. and Mrs. Lyons. Hi, I'm Robin Lyons. Um, I run Wisconsin Upside Down, which is a Down Center and Disability Organization. We're headquartered in Heartland. Hi, Countess Marissa My name is Kelly Lyons, and I attend middle school here in Heartland. I have Down Syndrome. For years, I have been talking to you about the Able Act. That has, that was passed into law in 2015. The law lets families save money for the futures of people like me, so I can go to college, get a medical care, housing, and transformation. This year. There are some additions to, to the law being suggested to Congress. So, and you co-sponsored this law when it came through, and we really appreciate that you stepped up for the disability community. Um, this year, the three changes to the law, one would allow people like Kelly, as they get older and get a job, to continue to um, donate with their wages to their ABLE accounts. Um, it would be in lieu of if they weren't participating in an employer-based retirement fund. So they would be able to, to, to put up to the, um, uh, the 
federal um, poverty, the net check is 12,006, something like that, a year, in addition to the yearly limit that they're able to count, they would also be able to take um, some of the special credits that low-income families and middle-income families um, have. I brought a one-pager <coughs> with information about that. The other two fixes, one of them really also has to do with my son, who's not here with us today. Uh, he was diagnosed with autism, but we didn't get the diagnosis till he was older, and we started a 529 college account for him. But it would be better for him to have an ABLE account now. Um, many people don't get that diagnosis, especially people with autism, until later in life. And once they have those 529s, there's no way to roll that into an ABLE account that they could access, which is more, and you understand, that's more important for people with disabilities. So that's the second fix to the law, so he would be able to access that money because he's not going to be able to use it for college. Um, the last fix is that ABLE um, starts at age 26, of, uh, up to age 26, and that law is to raise the age to 46, and that would be people with traumatic brain injuries or they may have been in a car accident or something gives them these same protections. Um, so there are a package of three changes to ABLE, and Kelly wanted to ask you. Can you tell me if you support these changes and if you will be willing to follow sponsor these bills? Well, I think you're talking about the Disability Integration Act. Uh, I introduced the House Companion in that bill last week. So I'm the principal author of the Disability in Integration Act. This was earlier introduced by Senator Schumer of New York, who was the Democratic leader. And if there's a schumer sensenbrenner bill, uh, people think it, will think that it has to be good when you have uh, the Democratic <laughs> leader and this conservative Republican uh, sponsoring the same thing. You know, my wife has had a spinal cord injury. She now has a traumatic brain injury, and she has a little sister with Down syndrome. And one of the things that I fought for through most of my career so that I'm not locked out of the house when I come home, uh, you know, is trying to integrate people with disabilities to the best they can into society as a whole. You know, that way they will be earning money, they will be paying taxes, but they should still have access to some kind of government benefit, whether it was a self-financed government benefit or in the case of Medicaid, you know, they don't get over the limit that's set by the states and they lose it all completely. So, uh, you know, getting people off benefits and on work, if they can do that, uh, uh, I think is a win-win-win situation for the, uh, uh, the beneficiary, uh, beneficiary's family and the taxpayers. And it seems to me that we shouldn't drop the ball because there aren't very many win-win-win situations that come up in D.C. today. Can I ask a question about the disability? I, it, I know you just introduced this. Yeah, I don't have a copy of it in front sure. of me. And, so and I understand that. I didn't realize that ABLE was also going to be, because there are already three ABLE bills, mm -hmm. those ABLE fixes, so this includes information about ABLE? Yeah, you know, I, I think I, it does. I'm not exactly okay. sure, but the Disability Integration Act is... Uh, uh, supported all across the disability community. And you have the Democratic leader and a very prominent Republican right. sponsoring it. Uh, that ought to carry some weight out there, if anything can. And I understand that it gives um, opportunities for community-based services for long-term care. No. How would that be funded since so much was cut out of Medicaid that would typically pay for that? Well, you know, for, you know, first of all, there's nothing that's cut out of Medicaid. Uh, what has happened is that the growth rate of Medicaid has been slowed down uh, under the Trump budget as well as under the American Health Care Act, which is a Republican replacement uh, for Obamacare. You know, the problem with Medicaid, you know, is that it's a 60-40 federal state share. And, the federal government can borrow money and print up money to pay its bill, which is why we have a $20 trillion national debt there. But the states can't do that. And many states, you know, have really, uh, because of unanticipated growth rates in Medicaid, uh, you know, have ended up having to cut other things like education out of their budget. Uh, so, you know, the, the need to reform Medicaid started out when Bill Clinton called for that when he was president 20 years ago. And Congress has now 
you know, responded to that, and more and more states ended up getting into a lose-lose situation because they have to fund the 40% state share of Medicaid dollars because that's what the federal government requires. But again, because they have limited budget authority um, and many states prohibit borrowing for current expenses, uh, they end up, you know, either having to pass a huge tax increase on the state residents or more likely, almost always likely, cutting out other things. And, you know, the other things, the four things for Wisconsin funds are uh, Medicaid, uh, education, both K-12 and the university system, corrections with our prison system and transportation. Um, and what's been happening with transportation with our state, and it's all decided in Madison, not Washington, you know, is that instead of uh, spending more uh, regular tax money on transportation, uh, we've been doing an awful lot of borrowing on that, and uh, that piper is going to have to be paid in the future. Well, I look forward to you know, or, or, it. Orange cones don't come cheap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for continuing to support the disability thank you. community. Yeah. Uh, Mary Lou McBroom Findlay, Highway 83. I realize that health care is a fairly complex problem. I'd like to see us go after some of what I consider the low Would you support giving the Health and Human Services Department or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, I'm not sure which it would be, the authority to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies over drug prices for Medicare and Medicaid? Well, the answer to that question is yes, and the drug pricing legislation comes up for reauthorization this year, so this will be something that will be uh, dealt with later on this year. Now, I have to issue a word of caution. Most of the new drugs that have come on the market, you know, have been a result of the pharmaceutical companies using up to 20% of their gross income uh, uh, to do research and development of new drugs, you know, which are drugs that are more effective and have fewer downsides. Uh, on that. And the fear that I have is that whatever we do on drug pricing, we've got to make sure not to shut off uh, the flow of money uh, to uh, develop new drugs, because if that happens, it's the patients that are going to end up suffering. Now, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, the, the huge increases in drugs like EpiPens, you know, those are, in my opinion, outrageous and unconscionable. And uh, the uh, Senate and House have already had hearings on uh, that, and the uh, CEO of the company that manufactures the EpiPens has not had a good day in answering the questions of my colleagues and the senators. You know, those kinds of increases, uh, you know, are, you know, uh, should not be allowed, you know, and, you know, frankly, I would like to see some kind of a regime where if a, the retail price of a drug goes over a certain percentage, uh, then, you know, in order to charge that, uh, they would have to justify why their costs required them to charge a bigger amount than that percentage uh, uh, that, that would be allowed automatically. And I think that's probably the, the best way to go about it. Uh, without shutting off the flow of research funds. I know that's important, but um, I believe that drug prices in the United States are much higher than at well, least in Canada and Mexico. Well, the, you know, there are two reasons for that. You, okay. know, the, the, you know, the first reason is that none of the government-run health care programs will pay for any R&D. Uh, so they say, you know, if you want to sell your drug in Canada, manufacture, you have to uh, pay out your R&D costs, which means that the U.S. consumer ends up having to pay the whole R&D cost while the other countries are getting a free ride. And, you know, that, in my opinion, is going to have to require international negotiation. And I hope that that's put on the table by the administration in the NAFTA re uh, negotiations that the President uh, has notified Congress uh, uh, that he's doing. The second thing is, I can speak specifically to Canada, and that is, is that uh, in order to have a drug legally prescribed in Canada, it's got to be on the government formulary. And the government formulary usually stays away from new, more effective, fewer downside, expensive drugs. So there are a lot of Canadians whose doctors prescribe these as the, the best treatment for what ails them. 
uh, that hop across the border and get their prescriptions filled at full cost in a U.S. pharmacy. Uh, because if your drug is not on the Canadian government approved formulary, uh, it cannot be dispensed by any pharmacy in Canada. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Diane Morrison, Heart Ridge and Heart. Uh, thank you for coming um, today. Uh, I just have a few questions um, and then a comment and a request for you. Uh, first of all, how many years have you represented Wisconsin's 5th CD in Washington? Since 2001. Okay, 36 years? No, 2001 is uh, 16 years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, you're right. Um, how many Republican members have been there at just as long or longer? One. Okay. So you would consider yourself to be a leader in the House and one of its most influential members? If you say so. Uh, I'm asking you because I, I know you don't support limits on terms. Um, would you also agree that we as people should expect our leaders to be honest and have integrity, as well as consider the benefits uh, for the majority of the people who need assistance? I always do that. Okay, good. My comment, since Trump has been president, there have been controversies, lies, lies to cover up lies, lies with no consequences, conflict of interest concerning issues of nepotism, interference with an FBI investigation, as well as historical, constitutional, and legislative major, oops, moments, with staff lying to mop up the damage to the House of the Presidency. Out of the first 100 days in office, he has been cited, he has told at least one lie, for 92 of those 100 days, PolitiFact named him Liar of the Year 2015. With all of these disturbing events, mixed truth lie signals, please tell me that you have concerns regarding this president. Because I think we would all prefer to have a president who would show some sign of knowledge of history, the Constitution, the legislative process, one who would stop having narcissistic temper tantrums, show some ability to apologize and take consequences for his actions, and show some humility with some modicum of competency to make this country proud. With that, this is my request. Since you have been in the Congress for a long time, I believe you are a leader there, I am asking you, begging you, to take a stand. Speak out over some of these lies, his continual attacks on the media, his childish name calling, um, forget what he was, his latest one, um, with the FBI uh, former <laughs> nut job, thank you, um, calling Senator Warren Pocahontas, etc. So I guess that is my main request. I think the people deserve it. Um, I think that you should keep this in mind as well as Christian values in every decision that you make. If not, maybe it's time to retire in 2018 and let someone else lead and speak out against about this kind of a president. Well, Any comments? And I have a uh, last other question. Okay. First okay. of all, I am responsible for what I say. Yes. I am not responsible for what anybody else <laughs> says. Uh, I have treated my constituents with respect uh, I attempt to do that in these town meetings, even though there are lots of people that didn't vote for Trump and don't like Trump, and they lost the election, and Trump is going to be president for a little bit less than four years. I have called for bipartisan action, and today the Wisconsin State Journal said the only two members of the Wisconsin congressional delegation that do anything in a bipartisan manner are Congressman Ron Kine, Democrat of the Cross, and me. I'm proud of that. And, you know, I work at uh, doing things in a bipartisan manner, and I think that I am respected, you know, out in uh, D.C. and in the Congress with my colleagues for doing that. Uh, you know, what I will say is that I don't like name calling. I don't do that myself. And if you read the Journal Sentinel this morning, uh, the article about Paul Ryan's. Uh, tribulations. Uh, as a result, you know, my comment was that I wish that the president would stop tweeting about real and perceived slights and would start 
uh, tweeting to promote the issues that the president and the Republican majority in the Congress share. And I think we would be able to get a lot more done for the people of this country rather than having these distractions. Okay, but I, I understand and I appreciate that. But like I said, it seems he does like people to praise him. I think he needs people in this party to tell him how it's affecting the country and our image around the world. I mean, I think it's very distracting. It's actually downright well, it, embarrassing. It, well, a week and a half ago I met with the Dalai Lama. And one of the things the Dalai Lama said was that you are able to accomplish more with love and respect than with anger. Those are very good words. Okay. Thank um, you. My last question, and I apologize, it's regarding your campaign last fall. It's my first chance to ask it. I was wondering why you would have your campaign office lie for you regarding a possible debate between you and your opponent, Kareem Pennebaker. I called your office, got your campaign office number, called them, and asked them about the request for the debate. And I was told by your campaign office that no one had ever made a request for a debate. I'm talking about, yeah. he was talking about a nonpartisan uh, person. There was no nonpartisan person that was willing to sponsor a debate. And I can tell you, I think that this is my 76th debate with some people in the audience since January 1st. Well, there have been plenty of debates. <laughs> okay, well, I'm just wondering because I called them again because I saw a photo of the certified letter that came with that request. It was sent to your office, received by your office. I saw it with the signature of your office. Um, and I thought that was very concerning because I, I do realize you've been the representative for a long time. But I think it is fair for your constituents to hear from other qualified candidates who might also represent us. Well, I think the other qualified candidates, you know, they have an obligation to tell their own story. Uh, and I've been telling my story. And, you know, again, uh, you know, there was no nonpartisan organization that wanted to sponsor a debate. Mr. Pennebaker asked me for him to sponsor a debate, and that was nothing but a media event. Scott Bachelor of Pine Ridge Circle in Delafield. Hi, thank you for coming to see us. I appreciate uh, you continuing to have town halls with us. Uh, my uh, my questions are uh, very much related to uh, to hers. Uh, would you agree that the actions and statements from the president in the past four months, if, if sustained for the next four years, would be catastrophic to the country? I already answered that question. I don't I, I'm so. not, I, I, it's not clear to me, but if you... I, I answered that question to Ms. Morrison. It wasn't understood. Uh, could you He's responsible your... for what he says. I'm only responsible for what I say. Well, I would, I would contend that you're responsible for the well-being of the country. Uh, and if the president is going to say things that are not, in, uh, are not going to be good for the well-being of the country, then it is your issue as it is my issue. And I take it very seriously. I have had no problem disagreeing with presidents of my own party on issues, and I have had no problems agreeing with presidents of the other party on issues. You know, he sent me a handwritten note when he signed the Freedom Act, which I authored. I worked with him to try to get criminal justice reform uh, passed. That kind of floundered. And I also worked to reauthorize and update the Voting Rights Act, part of which was declared unconstitutional. The State Journal has said, I'm the only, Hein and I are the only bipartisan uh, uh, people uh, in the Wisconsin congressional delegation. And, I, you know, I guess I can say that no good deed goes unpunished. Well, I think we may be talking past each other a little bit, because I'm not yes. referring specifically to policy uh, or, or uh, the Republican agenda or, or anything else uh, like that. I'm, I'm just referring to his actions. His words and his actions. Well, sir, I don't believe in personalizing politics and name calling. We had a senator named McCarthy in this state about 60 years ago who disgraced our state and was censured by the United States Senate. I'm seeing an awful lot of 21st century McCarthyism coming up around the country, and we ought to quit it and get to the issues. You know, everybody knew what Donald Trump's personality was before the election. He was elected. 
uh, and he's going to be the president, and you know, you're asking me to criticize him. I'm asking you to unite around him and to deal with the issues. That's the way America has operated the best, and I hope that every American would do that. I'm afraid I can't do that if I see the actions of this president. Okay, well, then, the then, then you can't do that, so let's move on. Our Constitution. Uh, Lori, is this Siesco of Kesco Way? Sir, you know, I said that repetitious things. You know, uh, you know, would not be allowed, and uh, okay. you know, you're repeating, you're repeating yourself, and you're repeating what Miss Morderson had to say. I'm sorry, you're taking up time from other people that might want to ask something about something right. else. This is a listening session. I assume. No, it is a town you... meeting. I never advertise these as a listening session. I'm sorry, I saw it as a listening session. Nevertheless, no, I those were fine goals listening sessions. Will, and look I, what happened to him. I have one thing that I want to say, and then I will. Say that. Okay. I have one thing that I, I want to say, and then I will sit down. I think I think you are, at least internally, you are very concerned about what you're saying. I believe every person in Congress is. And honestly, I have more confidence in every person in Congress based upon the behavior that I've seen from them relative to the president. And I don't have okay. the confidence in him. So all okay, I'm then, as you, far as I'm it, concerned, trust but verify. Yeah, We're not good. to the verify part yet, but we should have the trust first. My statement is that... I want you to use your conscience, and, I'm, and I want to keep saying that, and I want everyone else to keep saying that, is to use your judgment, all right, and don't, don't stick to strict party guidelines or an allegiance to a president who is not behaving in the best interest of the country. Sir, the I'll repeat myself. Look at my record. You know, the State Journal, which is not a Republican newspaper on Madison anymore, called Kind and Me the only two that were being bipartisan out there. Again, I will repeat myself. No good deed goes unpunished. Lori, C.S. Co. or C.S. Lowe of Kestel Way at Harpo? Cisco. Okay. Thank you for inviting me. I got your email. Mm -hmm. I was reviewing your yes vote against net neutrality with the repeal of the FCC rule of data privacy of Internet providers. And was wondering if you believe that Internet providers actually have public interest for their, you know, people that pay them, or their own self-interest and the interest of their stockholders if the, re the rule is repealed? Well, first of all, the FCC rule never became effective. Secondly, the Internet is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, not the Federal Communications Commission. Okay. And the Federal Communications Commission, in my opinion, stuck its big nose into something that had been regulated and regulated quite well by another agency of the federal government. And at the time the rule was promulgated, both commissions were dominated by people who had been appointed by President Obama. So they were not uh, the evil, nasty Republicans that uh, were doing that. Now, I am in favor of a minimum regulation of the Internet. You know, with the privacy rules, you know, currently the privacy rules are just like your credit card. You know, you can opt out, you know, if you don't want to, and they've got to tell you what the privacy rules are. Uh, and you can go to another internet service provider if you don't like the privacy rules of one that you might have been uh, patronizing. You know, and this is a different issue than, uh, than net neutrality. But, you know, the thing is, is that what the FCC did is they exempted some platforms, you know, like Facebook and Google, uh, from their privacy rules. And I think that when we're dealing, you know, with people who provide services on the internet, we should not have different strokes for different folks. Uh, because that would be used as a competitive advantage. Now, on the issue of net neutrality, that is an entirely different issue than was hit by the, uh, the, by the FCC rules. And, you know, as far as I am concerned, you know, if you want a premium service, which means faster internet and faster access, you ought to be allowed to pay for it. You know, the thing is, is that, you know, you've got all kinds of choices, you know, or if you want premium service, it costs you more. Just go down to the gas station. You know, if you want premium, you pay maybe 50, 60 cents more than if you want to have uh, have regular gas. That's the consumer's choice, and it seems to me that it, you know, particularly when we're dealing with something new like the internet, where there's been a huge investment in uh, basically wiring practically the entire country uh, for the internet and for Wi-Fi. You know that uh, you know we ought to be encouraging that because regulations like this would mean that uh, if they were at the beginning of the internet, 
would mean that only a very narrow group of people would have access to the internet and it probably would cost a lot more than it does now. So you believe that it's the FCC, not the FCC, Correct. that should be regulating that? Mm -hmm. That's who we should be contacting? Yes. Okay. And that, they have regulated the internet, you know, right from the very beginning. And they've had the privacy rules that say they've got to notify you what their privacy rules are. If you don't like them, you can opt out and shop around for somebody else. There isn't that many choices. Yeah, how, how, however, you know, you're right that there are not that many choices. But this could be used as a marketing tool saying we have a different and, according to them, better, you know, privacy rule than our competitor over there. And, you know, and let the individual consumers decide on that. You know, I think that each of you has a much better idea of how you want to lead your life than my colleagues and I or regulators out in D.C. do. Veronica Resto, Holly West in Brookfield. And everybody in the back hear her? No. Please, no. please speak up. Sorry, Honorable Congressman um, if this question was already asked, just please tell me. Um, what is your position on the Affordable Care Act? And then the second question is, do you expect to have tax cuts, tax cuts passed through Congress for small businesses this year? Uh, my position on the Affordable Care Act is it ought to be repealed and replaced. The House has passed the replacement. Uh, tax cuts have got to have tax cuts for small businesses. Most small businesses are the so-called subchapter S corporations where people are taxed at individual rates. So if you're at the top individual rate, uh, you end up paying a 90 or 39.6 federal tax. Uh, if you're IBM or GE, you pay a 35% federal tax. Makes no sense at all. You know, one of the things that drives uh, businesses out of this country that can afford to do it is the fact that we have the highest marginal corporate tax rate in the world. So you have these corporate inversions where you see Johnson Controls running off to Ireland where the corporate tax rate is 12.5%. We also have major multinational uh, corporations, U.S. based, not bringing their money back home that they earn overseas because there's a 35% repatriation uh, tax rate. If we got rid of that, you know, either with a one-time lower tax rate or some kind of a tax amnesty, we could bring over two trillion dollars back into this country that can be used to expand businesses and create jobs. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is it Kim? Is it McCabe? It is indeed. Okay, is Astro? Hi. My name's Kim. I'm a nurse, yeah. and I'm concerned about health care and my ability to deliver it, okay? Mm -hmm. I heard you talking to the media, so my uh, question is gonna change. Um, I was wondering when you said it is people's choice whether they purchase uh, insurance, right? Yes. So someone gets in a bad accident and they've chosen not to have insurance, correct? Mm -hmm. According to what you think is right and fair. They end up in my emergency room and I cannot deny them care. I need to do everything within my power. I've made that my life's work, okay, to save lives, to make lives better, okay? I want to know how in good conscience you can say that that's going to ultimately save us money. We're going to end up with ER after ER after ER rather than doing the primary care model of taking care of people. about interruptions. If this happens again, the meeting will be adjourned, as I said at the beginning of the meeting. Please continue again. That, that, was, that was it, my friends. Or if you have something to give to me, because I want to also thank you. You got me inauguration tickets for 2008, and I thank you for that. It was one of the proudest, proudest moments in my life to take my son there and to witness an inauguration. And so I thank you from the bottom of my heart for those tickets. Well, you know, let me say, you know, there is a matter of concern, uh, you know, about what you said. Now, before Obamacare came in, you know, it was passed in 2010 and wasn't fully up and running for a couple of years later than that. We had that problem. 
And you know, the thing is, is that there was not guaranteed insurability. There was not uh, an exclu or there were exclusions for pre-existing conditions, and there were lifetime and annual caps. Obamacare got rid of that. Now, the Republican health care plan keeps all three of what I have just said uh, uh, on that. It changes how it is administered. It changes who is eligible for what. But it keeps all three of those. Now, the original draft of the replacement that was being kicked around a year ago had none of those three. What I'm telling you, Kim, is that we listen to complaints like that. We have those three protections uh, in there. <coughs> now, having said that, you know, the person, you know, who wants to go without insurance, they end up getting fined by the IRS. You said you they, get, they end up getting fined by the IRS. Uh, they can show up in the ER because they decided not to have insurance, and they would be in the same situation as it was before, you know, Obamacare was passed. What we attempt to do, you know, in terms of encouraging younger people to get insurance, is to say if you were without insurance for over 63 days, then you have to pay a 30% penalty uh, on your premium. And this is an encouragement for them to get the insurance within 63 days after they turn 26 and they're off their parents' policy, uh, or if they lose a job with insurance uh, and are unemployed for a while or get a job with no insurance. You know, they still have the guaranteed insurability, no pre-existing conditions, no lifetime you know, or annual caps, but they will end up paying more for the first couple of years because they didn't get it. So, you know, this is a financial penalty that will not be a fine by the IRS. The IRS, you know, shouldn't be in the position of doing that. Uh, uh, but it will be a financial encouragement to do something that I think most of us would agree, you know, is the responsible thing to do. You know, if you're healthy, and we need to get healthy people in the insurance pool, because if we don't get healthy people in the insurance pool and only have sick people or people who are getting older, and we'll be getting sick sooner uh, rather than later, you know, then the premiums are going to go up and uh, uh, become unaffordable, and more and more people will end up getting put into a high risk pool uh, uh, on that. So, you know, the question is who's responsible for doing the right thing? If you blow off the government now, the government, uh, the IRS will fine you. Now, usually the fines are a lot less uh, than uh, uh, the cost of, of getting uh, the policy or getting some kind of a coverage, you know, under Obamacare. You know, I can speak for myself. I'm under Obamacare. The only federal civilian employees who are under Obamacare are members of Congress and their staffs by law. Even Obama was not required to be under Obamacare during his presidency uh, 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 on, on that. But with me, you know, the policy that I have, which is not the platinum policy, uh, you know, I have about uh, $10,000 a year in premiums. It's over 800 a month for just me and my wife, and a $5,000 deductible. So that's $15,000 out of pocket that I have to pay before collecting the first penny uh, on an insurance claim. Now, I can afford it. You know, I'll be the first one to admit that. But I'll bet you there are not that many people who can afford it in this country, and we've got to do something about that. And one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, the Obamacare insurance exchanges collapsing, more and more insurance companies getting out of the market uh, uh, for Obamacare patients uh, is because there are not that many young people who are low risk uh, uh, paying premiums and uh, you know they have to at least break even uh, on that so up go the premiums uh, uh, for the higher risk people and you know we're going to be seeing a double digit premium increase this year it hasn't been announced yet uh, for people in Wisconsin but folks in Arizona where there are more senior citizens uh, there last year under Obamacare for non-Medicare eligible people it went up over 100 percent and I think those of you that are not on Medicare and you do have insurance if next year's premium was double this year's you would be howling with rage. Just a quick follow up those young people who are not entering in now right 
What makes you think when they're 26, bulletproof, that nothing's ever going to happen to me mentality if you've met a 26-year-old, okay? Well, I was they're, one once upon a time. We all were. We all were. We were all bulletproof and 10 feet tall, okay? Nothing's going to happen to me. I'm going to be fine. I'm healthy. I take care of myself. I do all the right things. But you're one car accident away. And it's those people that you, you end up with such problems. But that's, that's education because now they say, okay, I get the policy, I pay all of this money, I've got a big deductible, and I get fined five or six hundred dollars by the IRS. It's cheaper for me to not be covered and go pay the fine than it is for me to be covered. And, you know, you're seeing an awful lot of that. Uh, you know, that's why there's the checkbox, you know, uh, on the Form 1040. Sure. So is there a better system than what is currently being uh, reviewed as opposed to the ACA? Um, uh, absolutely. That's what I'm looking for. Let's make I it. Think, I think with the 30% penalty, you know, we're going to say that, you know, if you decide to do this, and you know if you end up getting a bad diagnosis, you know, with no pre-existing conditions, you can get the insurance right away. And that's, that is, you know, that is true under Obamacare and under the AHCA. But, you know, having, you know, giving them an incentive, you know, to go get a policy, uh, you know, before the 63 days run out, uh, we have a better chance of getting that than saying you're going to get you know, a policy with big premiums and a high deductible uh, versus a fine that may be 20% of what insurance would cost. And, you know, uh, uh, younger people count the pennies just as well as older people do. Fair enough. I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on okay, that Okay, thank you. Is it Penny... Oh. Willow Creek, Pewaukee. Yeah, that's me. Um, I already asked. Can I refer to my friend who's been to multiple ones? No. Can I defer? Because my, my question's have been answered. Thank you. Jackie Burdett, uh, Chesson Court, Hartland. Yes, thank you. I'd also like to talk about health care. You have mentioned in the past that the reason you voted for the AHCA was because Trump campaigned on it and he won. Oh. No. Yeah. That's what you've said in numerous times. Well, I've, I've run three times on repealing and replacing uh, the AHCA, and that has been my position long before the advent of President Trump. Well, I'm just repeating what you told us at Tom's town hall. So, mm -hmm. so what I was going to say was that he, um, actually Trump, ran on no cuts to Medicaid, Medicare, or Social Security. These are quotes, too. So. Uh, insurance for everyone, and everybody is going to take care of much better than they are now. So the AHCA fulfills none of these campaign promises and, in fact, makes a lot of people worse off. Your theory sounds evil. Well, uh, first, of, first of all, there are no changes to Social Security benefits in the AHCA. There are no changes to Medicare benefits in the AHCA. And in terms of Medicare, there is no cut below what we're current, or Medicaid, there's no cut below what we're currently spending on Medicaid. We are just slowing down the growth rate in order to save the program. So all three of, you know, the, the points that you made, uh, you know, I don't well, think are bear, well, borne out by the facts. The other one was the insurance for everyone, and everyone will be taken care of. Well, there is, there is accessibility for insurance for, insurance for everybody. Nobody can be denied insurance uh, uh, under the AHCA, and I said that repeatedly, too. And, you know, that was as a result of the input that we got. Uh, from town meetings like this. You know, we're listening and, you know, somehow the goalposts keep on getting loose, so maybe they're outside the stadium now. <laughs> All right, that didn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. So you sent me, a, or probably not you, one of your staffers sent me a link to a political article. Uh, because I asked about your assertion about people getting insurance when needed and then dropping. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question about the qualifying event and open enrollment days. And in response to that, I got a link to a political article which didn't address that issue at all. It did address 
the insurance company stating that the rules and enforcement of coverage outside of open enrollment needs to be improved and the documentation for qualifying events needed to be improved and enforced. So I'm wondering why wouldn't you work on that instead of just repealing the ACA? There's so many parts of the ACA that could be worked on to make it work for everybody instead of throwing 24 million people off of health care or making it unaffordable. That's the part of ACA that we like. It's affordable. Well, when you're talking about doubling of insurance premiums in Arizona, that well, doesn't... Well, we don't live in Arizona. Arizona. Now, you're interrupting me. Well, right. oh. Oh. I'm answering your question. May okay. I answer your question? Okay. The ACA exchanges are collapsing. Tennessee doesn't have an exchange anymore. There's nobody that can get Obamacare in Tennessee because there's no company that wants to underwrite uh, ACA policies in Tennessee. In the counties in northwestern Wisconsin, there's only one insurer, you know, offering ACA policies. And when there's no competition, the cost will go up. Competition reduces the cost. Now, that, that's why we have antitrust laws to try to protect insurance. The House has passed, by the way, a repeal of the antitrust exemption for health insurance policy which is something that I have enthusiastically supported. Uh, you, know, in, you know, in terms of saving parts of the ACA, the pre-existing conditions exclusion ban is a part that is kept. Uh, the no lifetime or annual limitations is a part that we have kept. We have defined guaranteed insurability much in the same way, you know, although, you know, how the subsidies work and things like that, uh, you know, is uh, going to be changed. And we have also set up a, a high-risk pool because if we segregate out people out into a high-risk pool, that means that it will become more affordable for lower-risk people and we'll have more people who are lower-risk sign up. And there's over $100 billion that is put in the high-risk pool to uh, make those, uh, uh, make those uh, 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 premiums much more affordable. You know, I think we are looking <coughs> at the problems that the ACA has. We are keeping some good parts in it, but the fact is, is that if we do nothing in the ACA, and we haven't seen any support for any changes in the ACA from the other side since it became law, uh, the whole system is going to collapse within three to five years. And that is something that would be irresponsible on our part. And I don't want to say, fine, I agree with you, you know, let it, let it run its course. And then uh, you coming back three to five years from now saying, why didn't you tell us that? And why didn't you do something about it? We're doing something about it now, and that's the responsible thing to do. I would agree that that would be the responsible thing to do, to not let it collapse like President Trump has threatened to do. But it won't collapse by anything that we do in D.C. It will so collapse on its own. Not paying the reimbursements, but there, I've also read articles about the, the, is it the minimum loss ratio issue that also creates competition within the insurance companies. And don't some of those insurance companies also manage Medicare claims that you could use that as leverage for them to stay in the marketplace? I mean, I think there would be a lot of things that you could do to shore up the ACA well, without repealing it and coming up with a plan in, a, in what, two weeks uh, that's not affordable you and know, people you know, are going to lose health insurance. You know, sorry, sorry Ms. Burdett, but, you know, this thing has been worked out uh, for two or three years. And the thing is, is that there had to be some changes that were uh, made as a result of Trump's election because he would end up having to sign or veto the bill. And, you know, as President of the United States, I think he is entitled to have input on the subject. What President Obama said is he would veto any changes to the ACA, and he did. I don't agree with anything you just said. Okay, well then we'll just agree to disagree. Lisa Rist third of Oxford Drive in Hartland. Could you speak up a bit, please? Yes. Uh, I've had seven family members who have served in the military most of their career. I have two children currently serving in the military, one overseas. And when they go into the military, they have very strict background checks, which um, with interviews.
various people, the web builds bigger. It is the purpose of that is to see not only if they're upstanding people, but also to see where influences are that could possibly influence them monetarily or um, foreign wise. Um, there are people on the high levels of our government that are interested in otherwise. Do they have the same strict standards of background checks and also um, decorum? My children and people in my family have had to maintain a standard of decorum. And um, I don't see that same standard of decorum being asked of the commander in chief and other people in high levels of office in the manner in which they speak and demean others and treat others. And I would like to know if that, if there is a standard of uh, security background check that, that these people have to go through and a standard of decorum. Well, first of all, on security and background checks, people who are paid on the staff of the White House and who have access to classified material have to go through, you know, a background check before they get a security clearance. And, you know, that is without exception for paid employees in the executive office of the president. And it always has been that way. For the president, you know, he's the president. He was elected to be the uh, commander in chief. He doesn't have to go through a background check because it goes with his office. Uh, and again, all of these allegations came out during the campaign, and he was elected. Um, so, you know, if this was disqualifying for people before the election, they would have voted against him. He got enough votes to win. Uh, you know, in terms of decorum, I will go back and say, you know, the only mouth that I control is my own most of the time. Uh, and, you know, I don't control what anybody else says or how they say it. You know, I believe that one of the, we, you, one of the reasons you get respect is because you earn it. And I have attempted throughout my career to be respectful to people, even those who violently disagree with me. Would you say that there are holes in the security and background checks? Because we, we are currently seeing um, criminal investigations of people who supposedly got into positions that had background checks. And now there it's you know very severe Well, you know you know you know let you know let me say you know Mueller's appointment was to do a criminal investigation, not a counterterrorism or counter espionage uh, investigation. You know, and that was, you know, in the charter that Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein, Rosenstein uh, you know, uh, announced at the time of Mr. Mueller's appointment. Uh, Mr. Mueller, you know, whether there is a potential criminal violation or not uh, depends upon uh, the result of uh, uh, his investigation, which I hope will be wrapped up quickly uh, uh, on that. And Speaker Ryan has said that the congressional investigations will continue, you know, as planned. Although I can say that with Mueller being given the charge of a criminal investigation, it's going to be harder for us to get to the uh, bottom of this because anybody complete the Fifth Amendment and then ask for immunity. And let me say I'm opposed to giving anybody immunity, period. You know, even if they plead the Fifth Amendment and we can't get to it, uh, if they get immunity, uh, you know, them, uh, that evidence can't be used against them in a criminal trial, and I think all the evidence should be, you know, presented to the court in a criminal trial and either, you know, admitted into evidence or not admitted into the evidence uh, the, uh, uh, based on the law in the opinion of the presiding judge. It's my understanding that uh, uh, Mr. Mueller is a special prosecutor and that he can only uh, make comment and make rulings on the criminal investigation and will not be able to report on other findings that are found, can we um, request through you and through other members of Congress for an uh, independent committee to investigate what is occurring in our government because there are many of us who are very concerned. Uh, I would not support an independent committee. Uh, there are the intelligence committees of both the Senate and House of Representatives are looking into this. But, you know, let me repeat myself, you know, because this is a criminal investigation, uh, it is going to be much harder to get the witnesses who are involved 
to appear before the committee. And even if they're subpoenaed, they can come in and plead the Fifth Amendment or ask for immunity. Now, you know, I remember back during the Iran-Contra investigation in the late 80s, uh, there was a joint committee, uh, uh, you know, of the House and the Senate, and they gave immunity both to Oliver North and Admiral Poindexter, who was the National Security Advisor. They issued their report, uh, Poindexter and North uh, were indicted and convicted uh, of crimes, and their uh, convictions were reversed because the special prosecutor at the time used immunized testimony. Uh, so they ended up using their immunity to get a get out of jail free card. I don't want that to happen in this investigation or any other investigation because Congress wants to put out a made for TV roadshow uh, that will end up being a bigger obstruction of justice than anybody might ever be accused of because Congress can grant immunity for testimony and then you can't use it in a criminal trial. So what you just said, now said is that uh, you're worried about Congress and the, so why wouldn't there be a better, uh, with an independent committee? Why because, there be a better result? because the witnesses have the same Fifth Amendment rights that every other American has. And whether it's an independent committee, whether it is a congressional committee, uh, or whether, you know, it's a grand jury investigation or a criminal trial, the Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination is absolute and it is extended to all Americans regardless of what is being looked into. Uh, and the Fifth Amendment, uh, you know, is one of the things that has made this country different than practically every other country in the world. And we ought to respect that, but we ought to realize that the way to force testimony is to grant immunity. And with immunity, you know, you can, you're not self-incriminating yourself because what you're going to say is not incriminating in nature uh, in that. You know, so the clinker in this is, you know, if, you know, if Mueller subpoenas somebody before a grand jury or has the FBI go out and do an interview, you know, they're going to say, you know, I plead the Fifth Amendment. The same thing would be true of an independent committee or a congressional committee, you know, or something like that. The Fifth Amendment applies to self-incrimination uh, evidence absolutely regardless of what the forum is without exception. Would the committee not be able to report on its findings regardless if one person um, asks for immunity? They still have a pool of findings that they would be able to well, report. Well, you know, when you're, to when you're talking about you know, a criminal investigation and something like this, you need to have a smoking gun. And remember, in order to convict somebody of a criminal uh, violation, you know, all 12 jurors have to agree beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. You have one juror that says, no, I don't believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. That's a hung jury and the defendant walks. And many times to get to that smoking gun, it has to be investigated thoroughly. Yes, I know, but what I can say is, is uh, immunity grants uh, prevent thorough investigations. And just let me go back to what I said about North and Poindexter. <coughs> the jury said they were guilty. The appeals court said the prosecutor used the immunized testimony and reversed the conviction. I don't want to see that ever happen again. How about what you use Watergate as an example? Yeah, well... Poindexter. Yeah, well, you know, with, with, you know, with, with Watergate... I don't think uh, the House Judiciary Committee, and I was not on it at the time, granted immunity to anybody. <coughs> and if they plead the Fifth Amendment, they plead the Fifth Amendment. But, you know, when you have a criminal trial, the jury judges the credibility of the witnesses. Uh, Kenneth Brigada, County Trunk VV, Heartland. Congressman, I want to thank you for your years of wonderful representation in this district, your protection of the Constitution and our liberties. This evening, I wanted to bring to your attention an article of the New York Times, the 20th May 2017. The article is Killing CIA Informants, China Crippled U.S. Spying Operations. In this article, Sources were cited, and there's specific information that identifies the killing or imprisonment of between 18 and 20 individuals 
that were providing information to the United States of America in China. This occurred in 2010, so this was prior to Donald Trump, so we can't blame Donald Trump for this. This was, however, at or about the time that Hillary Clinton was using unsecured communications. My first question is, is the House, now that we have this information out there, is the House interested in pursuing and investigating this specific topic and the result of unsecured communications by, at that point in time, Hillary Clinton? Well, that's up to the Intelligence Committee uh, to decide whether or not to do that. You know, what I would say is the Benghazi Committee, you know, looked into all of that and issued a report that was about that thick. And it was the Benghazi Committee's uh, investigators that found out about the, the private server that Mrs. Clinton maintained uh, on that. Uh, you know, we did have Mr. Comey say that they found nothing criminal on that. That was in July. Then he sent a couple of letters in October that reopened and reshut uh, the case. I think the you know, frankly, I think that Barack Obama should have fired Comey for that uh, uh, rather than leaving it to his successor. And a follow-up question. It also appears that a group by the name of CrowdStrike uh, was the organization, the cybersecurity organization that was working for the DNC and also for the uh, FBI at that point in time. CrowdStrike was the organization that the FBI relied upon when they were supposed to be looking at links to the reported ties between Trump and Russia. The FBI never truly investigated. They relied upon the results of this organization by the name of CrowdStrike. And again, CrowdStrike worked specifically for the DNC. I'm hoping that as we go forward with the investigation uh, with the FBI on uh, the Trump-Russia ties, that it includes uh, the investigation of the organization known as CrowdStrike. Well, well, what I can say to that is my knowledge is that is still an open investigation. Uh, and one of the things that Congress has been very reluctant to do is to get involved in open investigations by the FBI or other law enforcement or, uh, organizations. And the reason for that is that if Congress gets involved in that and has public hearings and there's extensive media coverage, which there will be, it will be almost impossible to pick an unbiased jury anywhere in the country uh, if there are criminal charges that end up being filed against the uh, uh, people who were involved in, in those hearings. You know, I served on the Ethics Committee uh, uh, during the Abscam scandal, and there were seven of my colleagues that got caught up in that. And we waited uh, before imposing any type of sanction on our colleagues until the FBI uh, investigation was over with and indictments were returned by a grand jury. And I think that, you know, that's about the only way to go about doing it. Congressman, would you agree that it was inappropriate for Director Comey to rely upon information from an organization that was working specifically with the DNC and not doing a thorough internal investigation. In other words, the FBI relied upon CrowdStrike's <coughs> information to make a determination on what well, should be done. I, I, you know, I can say that there are two sides to every story. And you know, you're talking about a pending investigation and usually Congress sticking its nose in the pending investigation ends up, you know, having a very bad result. So as a result, we don't do it. Thank you, sir. Mike Walworth, Tree Ridge Court in Heartland. Thank you, sir. A real quick comment. Number one is uh, an update on the tax brief, the tax program, the tax tax reform. Second thing, as a guy who used to carry security clearance and do stuff for the State Department, I can guarantee you, if I've conducted myself the way the Democrat primary presidential candidate did, I would have been in jail, for sure. So I follow your comment, completely get it. 
Absolutely get it. So I'm more, the main point is tax reform. Are we going to get it this year? Uh, once health care is done, tax reform comes up next. Uh, and the reason for that is both of these have to be done through reconciliation bills in order to prevent a democratic filibuster in the Senate. Uh, and you can only, you know, once we pass a fiscal year 19 budget, then the reconciliation bill that is the health care reform bill uh, ends up dying automatically. So health care has got to be done, then we'll get the uh, uh, tax cuts uh, and tax reform. Uh, uh, and the sooner the Senate hurries up and <coughs> decides what the, uh, they can pass and we have a conference committee, the sooner we can get on with the next big item on reforming this country. Perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Lloyd Hendricks, Pinion Court, Heartland. I just want to thank you for coming and uh, obviously having such an excellent grasp of the issues. You can pay for me for saying that. Thank you. Uh, so Dave Pride Pembroke Way in Hartland. Thank you, Congressman. I can win me 12 people who are sitting here listening to you. And I again thank you for all the time you've come and sat here. On two issues, tolls and state tourism. I'm concerned that if the state government officials sign off on toll roads, <coughs> The state will lose federal highway interstate transportation flux. And second, we're going to lose face with a lot of our tourists that come across the border from our three neighboring states to come here and relax if they feel like they're down in Illinois at a toll booth. So there's two questions. I understand Illinois signed off their rights to interstate highway funds, and they did it. And it's arguably the fourth or fifth biggest industry is tourism. Many people rely on tolls are a bad idea. Well, you know, let me say I'm not in favor of tolls. And, you know, you are correct that when Eisenhower got the Interstate Highway Act passed, uh, it was prohibited from uh, charging toll on any highway, interstate highway that was. Uh, uh, constructed with federal funds, and there was a 90-10% match where the interstate highways were funded 90% by the feds. The Illinois toll road uh, was constructed entirely with state bonded revenue. So even though it had an interstate sign on it, uh, there never was any federal money into it. Uh, you know, I think that going to tolling is a step backward. There are our roads, for example, in Virginia, where I spend about half my time when we're in session, uh, that uh, has tolls on it, you know, including you know ultra-fast HOV lanes high, or uh, high-occupied vehicle lanes, where there is a rolling toll depending upon how plugged up the regular highway is. That was all done with private funds. Uh, so you know, my feeling is keep the no tolls where the public funds were. Don't change the law, but I would make a suggestion that if we do have tolls in Wisconsin, this would end up being done by the Wisconsin legislature, and maybe they ought to put the likeness of whatever legislator is pushing for the tolls, and we know who he is, uh, on the toll tokens, and maybe with the laurel wreath around his head like the Emperor Napoleon had on his coins. Thank you. Lois, is it Lois Kender of Hawthorne in Heartland? Thank you for coming. And I admire your knowledge. I, my basic question is something that seems to be lost. I'm concerned about my grandchildren going to pay for this debt. And I don't know if they've got a clue, but there's, it's ridiculous what's happening. I remember when I refused to vote for Carter for the second term because the deficit was 30 billion, I was just overwhelmed. And there comes a day when all the money comes in, he's gonna pay the interest on that debt. And I just don't see anything changing. You're absolutely right. And in the last eight years, uh, the total debt has almost doubled. So President Obama probably borrowed almost as much money as his 43 predecessors combined. Uh, there, two ways to pay the debt, you know, one are huge tax increases or benefit cuts. 
and 60% of what the federal government spends are on the so-called entitlement programs, the biggest of which are Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And the second thing is to run the printing press, uh, because the debt would be paid in this year's dollars with inflated money. Uh, Ponzi scheme, I kind of a Ponzi scheme, I, you know, I, I would say. But you know, inflation is a very slippery slope. And I remember when I was first elected, we had a 14 percent prime rate, and home mortgage interest rates were 22 percent. So nobody could afford to buy a house. And you know, we had a recession at that point in time, uh, and uh, uh, you know, we had to swallow some pretty bitter medicine to get out of it and we've stayed away from inflation. But the thing is, is that interest rates kind of go up and down with inflation. They've been fairly low because inflation has been under control. But if we go from the current interest rates, if they double or triple, then the interest on the debt is going to double and triple. And this country is going to be in a big world of hurt then. So, you know, I've always been in favor of balancing the budget, except in times of a war or national emergency that would have to be declared by a greater than a majority vote in Congress. Uh, and we ought to have a provision to pay down the debt. Now, let me get back to bipartisanship. At the end of the 90s, when John Kasich, who is currently the governor of Ohio, was in Congress and was head of the budget committee, he and Bill Clinton uh, balance the budget. Uh, there was welfare reform, you know, there was a slowdown in certain kinds of spending, and we actually did retire some of the national debt at the end of the 90s. You know, then we had a recession, then we had wars, <coughs> then we, you know, had the Obama administration, and it's about $20 trillion. You know, that is a ghastly amount of money. And, you know, unless we're willing to accept both big budget cuts and big tax increases, which nobody is willing to accept or vote for uh, in Congress. You know, then the only other way out, uh, you know, is to run the printing press, and that would be a real catastrophe. Um, Governor, or Congressman Kasich went to Ohio and mm -hmm. did a magnificent job mm -hmm. of straightening out their mess, and he's not... Um, an uncaring governor. No, he's can not. Can be done. And you know, I know him well. You know, I supported him for president, except ahead of George W. Bush, uh, before he couldn't raise the money because uh, uh, Bush Political Enterprises Inc. Uh, ended up uh, cornering all the money. But uh, you, you know, made a great president, Kasich. Yeah, uh, Rick Baldy of Shaniqua Drive. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, for the second time this year, senators have rejected an amendment that would have allowed for importation of safe, more price prescription drugs for Canada. This came about recently at, during May 11th when the members of the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee voted 13 to 10 to kill uh, the proposed amendment to the FDA. Reauthorization Act that would have allowed Americans to gain considerable savings from the importation of drugs from Canada. The other opportunity was missed January 11th during a budget debate when senators voted down a similar type of amendment. Since senators haven't been able to provide Americans relief from prescription drug price gouging by drug companies selling their products in the USA for prices 40 to 60 percent higher than in Canada, I would encourage you and the House to look at legislation to help resolve this problem. If the representatives don't want to go on record to vote against Big Pharma, they should tell the HHS Secretary, Tom Price, to utilize his statutory authority to set regulations for importation of drugs from Canada that was granted by the 108th Congress passing the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act, which became law in December of 2003. It's time for the House legislature to do what the majority of the Americans are saying in polls. Importation of drugs with more costs without affecting quality. 
The extra money Americans are spending on high-priced drugs could be spent on other products to create USA jobs, improve our economy, and generate federal revenue. The House should also pass bills to allow Medicare to negotiate the price of prescription drugs and block pay-for-delay deals between pharmaceutical companies to delay introduction of lower-cost generic drugs. Congressman, we ask that you support importing lower-priced prescription drugs from Canada and allow Medicare to negotiate prescription drug prices. Wow. First of all, I have always supported reimportation of drugs from Canada, but with a caveat, and this is a buyer beware type caveat. First of all, we can only reimport drugs from Canada if it's on the Canadian government formula, because they're the only ones that can be sold in Canada. And if one's doctor prescribes a drug that is not on the formula, you can't get it in Canada, even if you're a Canadian, so it can't be shipped back here. Now, secondly, there have been a lot of scams that have been involved, where people have gone online ordering drugs that they thought were coming from Canada, giving them the credit card number. The package arrives with a whole lot of maple leaves on it, but it's mailed from some Caribbean island nation, and the credit card chip is negotiated through a bank in a Caribbean island. What's the percentage of those? Do you want me to adjourn the meeting? Thank you. I'm answering your question. Uh, so, you know, the, you know, the thing is, is the customs is supposed to stop these kinds of packages, but they rarely do with the packages coming in. So there's no answer on what the percentage of those are. But I've heard about it, and usually it's a drug that's a fake uh, drug. You know, it's not genuinely from Canada, and buyers have got to be aware when they pick up their uh, uh, credit card bill and see what they thought they were buying in Canada was negotiated in the bank on the island of Antigua, for example. That's number one. Number two, with the... Uh, Prescription Drug Act of 2003, which had the provision in that made it legal to re-import drugs from Canada. I voted for that. That was the one where there was the three-hour roll call at 3 o'clock in the morning, but I voted in favor of that. The, the whole basis of that was to have drugs end up uh, have competing pharmacies, ending up competing against each other and reducing the price of drugs. So CMS was called something different at the time. It all came up with interactive websites where you would put your zip code in, uh, what drugs had been prescribed to you, and they would show you which pharmacy had the best package for the lowest price, and you go sign up with, with them in your neighborhood. Uh, the cost of having the competition uh, with the drugs that were covered under the Prescription Drug Act, which is practically everything that's FDA approved, uh, has ended up coming in 40% below uh, what was originally projected uh, at the time that the Prescription Drug Act was passed. So the competition was working, and, you know, and I would hesitate, you know, given this kind of uh, uh, effect uh, that, uh, uh, you know, the government should start sticking its nose in, uh, because I don't think any type of government regulation and the lobbying that goes on in the executive branch would result in an average 40% reduction in the total cost of prescription drugs uh, that are offered to Medicare-eligible Americans, uh, uh, you know, through the Prescription Drug Act of 03. Uh, Lisa Valadi, Valadi, Longmeadow, and you will be the last one. Hi there. Thank you for taking my question. First of all, I need to let you know I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. I am just someone who is here because I am a health care advocate. What I want to see from my congressman and from you in particular is to see more of that. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a Democrat. I am here for you. Because I'm so tired of hearing people say we have to cut Obamacare. We have to do this. There's so much more room for compromise. And I'm, it sickens me. I can't even sleep sometimes. I wake up knowing that this is the direction we are heading. 
I have so many small points to make, but first I want to go back to the big debt. George Bush, a man whom I voted for, he's a great, affable guy. I would say he's a man who did, who did good badly. He wanted to do what was good for our country. He took us to war. He was the only president that made a tax cut. Most times, you can make a tax increase to pay for that war. We are still in that war. We have never raised taxes to pay for that war. Then you take Obama, blew up the debt again, voted for him too. A lot of that was paid back in interest that he put out for the auto companies. That has been repaid. But back to my health care. <clears throat> That's what I really care about. First of all, whether you're a Democrat fighting for this or a Republican fighting for that, everyone is really missing the structure. <coughs> you're arguing over who pays for what instead of how do we fix the structure. It's broken. I get awesome health care coverage, but I know people have been so hurt who haven't. My sister-in-law, for example, she had two young children, and her husband lost his job, and then she got cancer. They went into such huge debt because now she had this pre-existing condition. And when you live with that kind of death, and you are, I had the good insurance, but they didn't. You can help all you want. My family cannot support her family. It hel this helps so many people. I have so many little points that I would love to bring up with you. But I can't do all that right now. I'm going to bring up just a couple of smaller points, which are the, the pre-existing condition does have a big loophole that concerns me a lot. And then I want to get back to the foundation. I have really good health insurance that is employee-sponsored, but all of America seems to forget health insurance is expensive. It costs the employer approximately $20,000 per family to give us insurance, give or take. If you have great insurance, maybe it's 24 dollars lesser quality, maybe at 16. Why would anybody think that buying it on Obamacare will cost any less than when you're getting a group plan? So if my employer is paying $20,000 for me to have insurance, why wouldn't it cost Joe Schmo $20,000 to get similar insurance? The problem is you need to get the cost of health care insurance down. It's the structure. And all everyone is doing is arguing, how do we pay for it? Is with apples or oranges. Have you looked at direct pay? why you can get a knee replacement for under what, direct pay, concierge, whatever you want to call it. You can go there and do a private pay, stay there even for a couple of, couple of days longer than what you would if you had insurance. And the doctors are still making plenty of money, and some will even argue that it's better quality of care. It's like six or $7,000, depending on where, but the, the one figure that I'm reading about but if you go private pay, I have had knee surgery. It was like 60 grand. Now, I had excellent doctors, they had excellent doctors. Why are we arguing about, or not arguing, discussing the 50, 60, $70,000 gap? Who's making that money? It's all the layers of administration in between. That is a great starting point for helping change the structure, the foundation of healthcare. So anything that you do, sir, should not knock one person off the roll. Because I have access to a trip around the world. I can charge it. Uh, that isn't solving it. Please don't be partisan. Well, Look at the structure to change it. That's just one step. I'm sure there's many. Okay, may, may I answer that part? Uh, Obama asked for Republican input when he gave his Obamacare State of the Union type message in September of 2009. Many of us, myself included, sent him letters with suggestions. We never got any response. There was a decision that was made by Pelosi and Harry Reid, who was running the Senate at the time, that this would be something that would be partisan, and it ended up being partisan. When the glitches started appearing on Obamacare, he did some things by executive order that he probably shouldn't have, you know, such as delaying the individual mandate and the employer mandate until after the 2012 election. Anytime we tried to make some changes to Obamacare in the House of Representatives, it was a party line vote. We have asked, you know, in terms of repeal and replace, which was one of the 
principal issues of the last campaign, and I ran on it three times, and I'm fulfilling the promise that I made to the voters in each of those times. You know, the you know get input from Democrats. We never got any input from a formal basis. You know, we we did respond to the complaints about pre-existing conditions, lifetime. Uh, 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 and, and, and annual caps and guaranteed insurability. Uh, and all of these things mean that there will be more coverage, perhaps for more expensive things. So it's going to raise the cost, uh, you know, of that, you know, since the insurance companies, you know, it's basically a risk sharing pool and you're putting more claims in with higher risk people. Uh, but we decided that that was the right thing to do. So there, everything I've, that we've been doing, uh, this is a trade off. You know, I have said it before that Obamacare uh, is on a death spiral now. With uh, exchanges folding, uh, with insurance companies pulling out of the market, particularly in lightly populated areas, and there will be a complete collapse in Obamacare, in my opinion, in three to five years. Uh, so doing something now, uh, uh, I think, is, you know, the responsible thing to do. Now, you know, any health care bill is a compromise, you know, and I agree with you that the layer upon layer of administration, you know, eats up money, you know. Uh, you know, CEOs of major hospital chains make over a million dollars a year. You know, I'm not asking for a pay raise with what I make, but I think my responsibilities are a lot bigger than the CEOs of major hospital chains. Uh, so maybe they ought to take a pay cut, uh, you know, on that. But you know, I, you know, I, you know, I honestly, you know, think that you know you're going to you're going to have to reform uh, the structure by reforming the system, because I don't think you will be able to get uh, the structure of healthcare where all of this money is, you know, basically wasted on filling out forms, pushing pencils, and uh, pushing the enter button on computers, uh, you know, without saying that there's going to be less money for this and then they're going to have to be forced to economize. There's actually, well, I, I guess I would say it seems like it would be a whole lot easier just to make some fixes to what we have now instead of watching it, waiting for it to spiral out of control out of its own, um, increase the penalties, just beef it up whatever you can. And again, I don't care if you repeal it. I don't care what you do. I just want something better. And if it's not better, it, there's no point. Well, so if anybody, okay, I know you wanted me to wait for you. So okay. thank you. I really appreciated that. Um, so I just don't see why we have to hurry up and do it. Why not just do a few things to fix this and then fix the structure? Maybe have, like you do with Medicare, for example. Uh, those Medicare supplements, they're all the same. Make it easier, make sure there's, uh, maybe there's only 10 policies available, because that was one of the problems before, is people were underinsured, they would buy skimpy policies. Maybe nobody, not one congressman, should have a policy that's any less available to anybody in America. We're all on Obamacare. But that's now, but, what, but there's, there's the 10 essentials now. But, but before that, there wasn't. Okay. Uh, making sure that Congress was under the same rules as everybody else, under Senate rules, could not be put in a reconciliation bill. Before we passed the repeal and replace Obamacare bill, we passed another bill outside of reconciliation that said that Congress would be under the same rules as everybody else, which has been the same since the beginning of Obamacare. This is my last point. When my kids are arguing, and they'll bicker back and forth, and they'll be, it's his fault, it's his fault, he wouldn't pass this in the best, we offered this and this, I always tell them, someone's got to stop first. Someone's got to make the truth first. And you keep bringing up how, how the Democrats didn't want to do this to help out that, and they'll bring something up about the Republicans. Someone's got to come first. Someone's got to be bipartisan. Someone has to take care of us. How can people sit there? How can they sleep at night and think in partisan terms? We need people just to, like I tell my kids, someone has to make the truth well, first. 
Thank you, so you much. know, ma'am, I'll get back to the point that today's Wisconsin State Journal editorial singled out Congressman Kind and me as being bipartisan. <laughs> bipartisan. <laughs> 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 Meetings adjourned. I, I'm interested in yeah,